thank the organizer first. I uh, invite me to this uh, really nice place. In fact, uh, I should confess that this is my first time to visit London, except uh, kind of passing through the hydro several times. So it was uh, really great. Um, and uh, I actually like that this uh, the conference that many speakers actually has generous one hour, or even just kind of go beyond the one hour. Actually, Volodya actually already set the record. <laughs> and um, uh, another nice thing is uh, my talk is toward almost at the end, and a lot of introductions has been done, a lot of things uh, has been mentioned, so I don't have to go through the many introductions and directly go through the, the point. I think that's another good chance. On the other hand, um, turns out then uh, I have to kind of scoop really deep and pull out some of the most recent results. Uh, so as you will see, that some of the results is just published, or some of them are not published. Some of them are not even analyzed. But I want kind of some share some um, ideas and excitement and some of the comments, uh, especially critical comments. Um, uh, so and also, I think I know that this is getting uh, uh, the afternoons and after lunch, especially. So unless we are, I should be a little bit more energetic. Everybody uh, can easily fall asleep. So what I propose is just stop me any time if you want to ask the questions. Uh, if you don't like, then if you disagree, just stop me any moments, and we can kind of have the discussions on site. I think that's something I want to do. All right, so the original title of the talk is graphene and uh, hexaboron nitride heterostructures, but that then it becomes clear that um, only with this topic probably I cannot cover uh, one hour. So I will start with this, uh, but on the, on the way that we are, we, are, uh, we are going to visit a few different topics that uh, I just chose. OK, so um, the, the motivation of the going for the hexaboron nitride uh, graphene heterostructure is uh, basically the quest for the, the higher mobility in graphene. And why higher mobility? Well, the past history on the two-dimensional electron gas already told us that uh, whenever you have the better samples, better mobility sample, you start to see the different physics. That's uh, one of the main motivations, and many people try to improve the quality of the sample, and realizing that most of the limitation of the sample quality, especially comes from the substrate, either it was roughness or it is uh, the, the, the charge uh, electron hole puddles, or charge traps, Whatever it is, most of them actually comes from the substrate and ex in, uh, extrinsic effect. So the obvious thing is you want to kind of get rid of the substrate and suspend it, uh, the graphene. And then as uh, Andre shows a beautiful result um, already in, the, uh, in this conference, once you get rid of substrate and properly anneal the sample, the mobility of now graphene can reach is even kind of millions or even uh, several millions of the levels. So that's actually good directions. But on the other hand, suspend sample has its own limitation because it's uh, fragile. As you imagine, that's one atomic thick sample. So uh, if you want to design a bit more complicated devices, or if you want to do something uh, uh, more robust type of the experiments, say thermal cycles many times and so on, this may not be the best sample you want to deal with, especially if you want to make the multi-probe samples with less strain on the sample. Um, it becomes quickly technically challenging. So the natural direction we want to look is, uh, are there any other substrate that kind of mimic the vacuum, the vast substrate we can think about? Well, it turns out that nature actually provided those kind of substrate. We already heard the boron nitride, especially hexaboron nitride, which is very close to uh, the graphene-like forms, but it's an insulator simply because uh, you can think about two carbon atom in the unit cell is replaced by boron and nitrogens completely broken symmetry state in terms of graphene languages, therefore open up the large gap, and all of these things, and especially if you have the high quality boron nitride sample, which such as uh, the, the crystal we obtained from the, um, the, our Japanese colleague in the name, uh, names, um, that can be good substrate that more or less mimic the vacuum. Well, um, this is some of the recent results. Again, the, my collaborator at Columbia, the Pops Pathis Group's uh, STEM result, so here that we put the boron nitride, uh, the graphene on the boron nitride, and do the STM studies. Michael Kromi actually showed that a similar image yesterday. But what you see here is up to, say, a few tens of micron is completely flat. Um, in terms of the, uh, the flatness, is under few sub angstroms of the, the, uh, the roughness only do exist, presumably coming from still STM resolutions. 
Yet, uh, there is a beautiful, this hexagonal network of the graphene is there, not much disturbed by the surface and extended over the quite a large area. So you can imagine that this is one of the really kind of great substrate provide to the graphene to the best quality of the uh, electronic properties here. Now, one way we can uh, characterize such electronic properties um, that I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, is quantum artifact in a setting in this sample and showing that that's actually quite different, uh, well, uh, much better than what we usually see the sample on the silicon oxide, for example. I'm showing here some of the, uh, the old results that we had uh, the, uh, at the same time as the Manchester groups. Uh, um, the quantum artifact seen in the disorder graphene sample sitting on the silicon oxide. Um, this is one of the hallmark results showing that indeed graphene is quite different from any two-dimensional system. Um, most uh, the notable thing is this uh, quant uh, quantized steps going on the four times of half integer steps um, can be explained by again these these pseudo spins and uh, battery phase and all of these things. Um, but nevertheless, in retrospect, um, the here the sample is disordered enough so that each lambda level that uh, correspond to this uh, the forming of the quantum whole step. We should consider that as a spin degenerate, as well as a pseudo spin degenerate, or valley spin degenerate, or whatever you, uh, your, your preference call. Now, the pseudo spin or valley spin should be degenerated in single particle picture. That's OK. But now, assuming the spin degenerate means that each Landau level is broad enough so that you don't see that kind of the Z man effect uh, is not big enough to split your Landau level. So, in a sense, it is a pretty much a disorder system. In retrospect, if we had much better sample than this, maybe seeing that the, the, this battery phase and the pseudo spin out of the structure will, may, uh, might not be straightforward. So the nature already gave us the initially the disorder enough sample so we can quickly figure out this half integer shift to quantum hole. But in, um, in, as you go to the better sample, such as that sample that I showed you, uh, the graphene sitting on the boron nitride, things immediately start got changes. For example, that when you look at this at the zero field uh, characteristic, resistance versus gate voltage, first thing we notice is peak is extremely sharp. And if you just take this half uh, width of the full maximum as an upper bound of the disorder, uh, the charge inhomogeneity we have here is much less than 10 to the 11 um, uh, electron per square centimeters. On such a good sample, when you apply the magnetic field, what we are seeing is, well, those kind of these half integer quantum effect now turn into the just the integer quantum effect. Basically, uh, here, as you sweep the field and fix the gate bolt, we see that not only two and six originally we saw, but we see also the signature of the three and four. And uh, basically, we are seeing more or less all the integer uh, quantum all steps appears. Probably better picture is, uh, better, better data is we fix the, um, Gate, uh, the magnetic field at 14 Tesla and sweep the gate voltage, then we are seeing not only two, but we'll see one, zero, and if you go to the high magnetic field, we see the three, four, and so on, right? So basically, all the Landau level we start with is completely split in such a better quality sample. So that's an interesting part. And in fact, this was seen in the sample on the silicon oxide, but you have to go to the really high magnetic field, such as a 40 Tesla and 45 Tesla in that level, and then um, first of all, Zeeman splitting eventually win over, so we know that at least the, all these quantum ore effect split in two, but on the top of that, due to the many body effect, we are seeing also this uh, valley, uh, valley spin, so pseudo spin also, also got splits off that basically splits all the Landau levels. Um, so this effect itself was seen before, but what is interesting thing is now those kind of effect can be seen. Uh, you don't have to go to the high magnetic field lab, but you can just uh, do it at home for the look at this experiment. Of course, human nature is greedy, so when we see that such a good sample, we just bring the sample immediately to the magnet lab and crank up the field and see what you, what you get. And here is the uh, high magnetic field data. Um, you see that beyond the 15 Tesla, so 35 Tesla, I see that two and three steps here. But on the top of that, there's other steps up here. Uh, and in the uh, uh, magnetic uh, hole resistance uh, with combined with uh, zero of the, this RXX showing that there's additional quantum wave effect. And if you just uh, see that what is the uh, corresponding filling fractions, uh, filling factors, that's actually correspond to four third and eight third. And we are seeing this basically fractional quantum wave effect um, 
that correspond to four third and eight third in multi-terminal geometry, properly made whole bar geometries. Right. So seeing diffractions is not a new thing in a sense in the graphene. Uh, was uh, this uh, the reported a few years ago uh, uh, by Ivan Dre groups and uh, my group um, that for the signature of one third, but that sample is two terminal suspense sample. And often that is considered as a signature of the uh, fractional quantum effect, but real observation of fractional quantum effect should come from both the multi-terminal measurement in the whole measurement and the longitudinal resistance measurement. And this is, in a sense, the, uh, the strong evidence we can present as a diffractional quantum effect. Now again, uh, we fixed the largest magnetic field, in this case, the 35 Tesla. And if you sweep this gate voltage, what you are seeing is um, that, again, one, two, three, four, and those kind of broken symmetry integer quantum effect. On the top of that, uh, uh, in between, that you see that all these uh, blips and corresponding this dip. So we know that there are many of this diffraction appears. If you start to assign 4 third, 8 third, which actually appears here as very strong, and some of them 10 third, 11 third, 13 third uh, are there. And if you are bold enough, you can assign the other, other things such as 8 fifth and 7 third and so on. Right. So at this point, you start to see that, wow, well, OK, so this, this again, zoo of the diffractions and so on. Well, we know that all this fraction actually do appear in the gallium arsenide, and gallium arsenide support probably more than tens of the fractional quantum effects and so on. So in a sense, it is expected. Sample qualities becomes better. Then you see that uh, the, uh, the, some of the strongly correlated, or not the strongly correlated, correlated electron phenomena, such as the fractional quantum effect, sets in. So what's next? Well, the next important question you can ask here is whether these series of the fraction can be different from what you are seeing in, say, conventional two-dimensional system. So the, to make the long story short, my conclusion is yes, they are somewhat different. And then I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, the argue that what's the difference. So to make it kind of, uh, to, to argue the difference, uh, we have to kind of step back and just think about the fractional quantum effect a little bit more. So the fractional quantum effect, as I said, is uh, the correlated electron states and usually can be only explained when you think about the many body type of the effect. And one third of the fraction was the first one that observed in gallium arsenide 2 deck and was explained by the Bob Laughlin and by setting up this, uh, the famous Laughlin's wave function here, right? And basically that this many body wave functions and that uh, they, uh, they explain this existence of the one third. Now, what you're seeing in this Laughlin's wave function, by the way, uh, it only contains orbitals, and that it's kind of spin sector is not there. And when Laughlin actually wrote this wave function, he assumed that, well, all the spin is polarized. And that makes sense, because usually this quantum effect, fractional quantum effect, appears at relatively high magnetic field, where probably Zeeman's energy will align all the spins in one direction. Once you polarize the spin, basically you don't have to consider it's spin sector of the symmetry. So the only consideration is anti-symmetry of the, this wave function part. And that's a basic motivation of the writing this Laughlin's uh, wave function. But then soon it realized that actually by the helpering, um, if you just compare the energy scale, there's just some things that one has to be able to be careful. Now, I just plotted out here the energy scale of this typical uh, the two-dimensional electron gas with finite mass. Basically, the cyclotron energy scales, the distance between the Landau level is the largest. And then that's basically, we start with the single particle pictures and then construct this many body effect considering the Coulomb energy scale, which is about a few tens of percent uh, of this uh, cyclotron energies. Now, compare with uh, these two energy scales, and if you just plot it out the Zeeman energy, it's actually only a percent of this uh, the cyclotron energy scale. It's extremely small. Therefore, in approximation, probably the better picture we just start with is we start with this spin degenerate Landau level and construct this wave function from there. And that's what actually helped to show that how we can do that. In fact, this picture was a better, can be even better explained if you just kind of throw in this so-called composite fermion pictures. In that picture, basically, you uh, consist of, you kind of interpret this many body state as a composite fermion, say the each electron grabs the two, uh, two uh, flux quanta, and they form the composite fermions. And the composite fermion Landau level basically is responsible for the solved fractions. There, in that picture, 
what happened for the one third state is basically among this composite fermion, their spins polarized by the many body interactions or residual interactions. In a sense, this can be considered as quantum or ferromagnet among this, the, uh, the composite fermions in this system. So th the reason I'm telling you here is basically even for the one third state um, in fractional quantum state, this basically the alignment of the, uh, the spins and the spin polarizations has some of the interesting origins there. Now taking that message back to the graphene becomes much more complex or actually much, much more rich, I would say. The reason is on the top of the spin, we are spin of the electron. In the graphene, we are dealing with the pseudo spin or valley spin here, right? So your V functions of the each electron has a four degree of freedom coming from choosing the spins and the uh, this valley spins. And of course, energy scale, the same stories that I mentioned in the Galileo arsenide, more or less works. Cyclot energy is much, much larger than any other energy scale, especially Gman energy scale. Therefore, it becomes essential, like the, uh, the uh, one-third state in gallium arsenide, this, the four component of spinners, let me call this SU4 spinner structure, becomes quite important to understand the fractional quantum or effect set in, in, uh, in the graphene. So that's basically the message I was, uh, I'm trying to uh, address here. So how can I prove that? Well, experimentally, actually, one can clearly argue that that's the case. I just show you here that fractional quantum effect appears only in the lowest Landau level, n equals zero Landau level. So you see that there are uh, fractions one third, two third, four third, and five fifth, uh, eight fifth actually going on in that direction. Looking at this sequence, just to look at the sequence, we can immediately pick up the one interesting fact. We are seeing one third, four third, but we are missing the five third. Now this fact, that seeing that only one third, four third, but not seeing five third, already good enough to give us some of these the scenarios should hold than the others. Let's assume that instead of that arguing that I start with SU4 type of this Landau level I start with, somehow there are different scenarios possible so that such that say G-man splitting, splitting is strong enough so that I start with a spin split Landau level such as like this. So spin up and spin down is split. Or maybe you can argue that, well, you put the, your sample onto uh, boron nitride, which actually tend to break the AB sublattice symmetry. So in the worst case, that I may actually break up the, all the symmetry by just single particle regions. So assume that that's a kind of another scenario. There's no degeneracy I started with. In fact, I started with all symmetry broken states, like the one, two, three, four type of the uh, integer quantum all state I'm seeing. I will argue that. This and that is not a possible solution, a possible uh, the case uh, that if I just kind of match with this experimental, uh, the, uh, the fact that I'm seeing the one third and four third, but not five third. Where each Landau level has particle asymmetries, which means, for example, if this is the right scenario, that if I see the one third, I should be able to see the two third about the similar uh, strengths, which means if I see the four third, I should be able to see the five third. Well, that's not the case. I'm seeing the four third, but no five third. So this scenario is gone. How about SU2? Same thing for the particle symmetry across here. If I see the one third, I expect to see the five third, but that's not the case. So we should eliminate that. So by eliminations, only viable solutions, viable case, scenario that I can support uh, this experimental case is basically I should assume, I'm forced to assume that initial Landau level I start with should be SU4 type of symmetry. Well, because of this, uh, the underlying interesting symmetry only do exist in the graphene case, not for the, uh, the, <coughs> the conventional two-dimensional electron system. In fact, uh, this system start to give us somewhat different behavior. I will just give you one, one, one more example here that I just show you here the four third the fractions at the different temperatures. Basically, this uh, zero start to lift it up because the uh, the, uh, the activations across uh, this, uh, the composite fermion lambda level um, by just measuring that uh, this RNS plots, say even different magnetic field, I can just show you that how the gap actually scale for this uh, the uh, fractional quantum or state of four third. Turns out gap scales are more or less the scale root type of the behavior which is expected. But what is interesting thing is the size of gap is uh, fairly large. Four third, which is uh, in this case one of the strongest fractions 
the gap size is about 20 Kelvin. Bell comparison with the Gardner Snyder case, this is a factor of the five larger than what you're seeing in the Gardner Snyder. So the fraction is fairly robust. Um, the other thing is um, that, oh, by the way, those kind of gap is actually matching with some of the calculations based on the, uh, the spin polarized but by, uh, value on, pol on polarized ground state correspond to four third, but that's actually theoretical uh, description. But uh, besides that, in fact, if you just do this gap measurement for the all other fractions that I just mentioned, we clearly see, start to see that some of the interesting trend. For example, the first of all, we are seeing that all this black uh, point, which is a four third, eight third, 10 third of the gap size at the 35 Tesla, they are all larger than open circle, which corresponds 7 third, uh, 11 third, and 13 third. In other words, if I have the even numerator in one third state, their gap is larger than odd numerator states. And also, there's an interesting trend. As you go to the higher fractions, size of gap decreases, especially this all, uh, even numerator states. And those kind of structures, in fact, related with that SU4 structures and the in, inside of the SU4 spin structures, I'm going to argue in, in a moment. But nevertheless, I think this uh, gives us that kind of the rich flavor that what generate by this SV4 type of the spin structures in each lambda levels. And there are also, of course, some of the unanswered questions that basically the, uh, the, the, the questions to the, the drawn to the theorist that why actually 1 third is uh, so much larger than 5 third and those kind of things. Now, these structures of the, um, the SV4 is, in fact, you don't have to even go for diffractions. In fact, these structures can be also seen so-called this broken symmetry, the integer, integer quantum states. Here I'm showing you low field measurement for the, all these integer quantum states, 6, 10, 14, but in between you see the, all the steps, correspond 7, 8, 9, uh, uh, 11, 10, 12, and those kind of the broken symmetry states. Now, one thing that we also notice here is if you just do the gap measurement again for all these broken symmetry integer quantum states, we are seeing that even state, say such as a four and eight, is much larger in terms of the gap than the other even uh, the odd the integer quantum states such as a three and five. At least factor over six larger. So it's a very similar flavor as that what I just showed you in the fractional quantum state for the even numerator state versus the odd numerator states. We can actually do this better. We can take the this even numerator states, and I just measure this gap at the different magnetic field. Now, what we do here is we just tilt the magnetic field so that I fix the total mag the perpendicular direction of magnetic field. So orbital part of the energy is fixed. Then I try to tune in-plane magnetic field changes here. Um, in a sense, the total the perpendicular magnetic field is fixed, but changing total magnetic field just tune these uh, spins sectors of the energies. Right. So ideally, if the gap here is just a spin gap, we expect that this gap is linearly scales with this total magnetic field because the, uh, the, the perpendicular magnetic field, the orbital part, is fixed. But what you're seeing is it's, not, it's just increasing, but not linearly, and with a different slope. If you just measure the slope part, this, the higher magnetic part, the field part, the slope is close to G factor is equal to. So it's like the smell is like the spin. But as you go down to the low magnetic field, low total magnetic field, that corresponds to the larger G factor. In other words, you start to speed, flip some more spins, than more, uh, more, uh, uh, more spins than one spins here. In fact, this behavior is, was seen in Gallimarsenite case. Well, they actually, this it was taken as evidence of this, the uh, spin scumians, that excitations. Basically, what you are seeing here is in the low magnetic field, you excite the scumians with many flips of the spins. But as you increase the magnetic field, total magnetic field, you just start kind of uh, spin splitting becomes uh, expensive uh, because of the exchange interactions. So you start to flip there just one spin, and your scumian size becomes small. And those kind of things that claim in the garlic case, what you're seeing here basically give us a similar flavor that in nuclear four states, is basically spin polarized state in the ground state. 
and excitations coming from presumably this uh, uh, spin flipped uh, scumions. Now, these same stories, when you actually transfer into the one fourth of this uh, SU4 feeling, or in other words, all the integer quantum states basically completely changes. Their energy gap is uh, small, and not only small, if you just do the same experiment, changing the in plane magnetic field, and see how the gap scales, well, many cases, gap does not depend on the in-plane magnetic field, indicating that it must be some sort of the valley spins, which actually does not care about the in-plane field. But even more, some cases, in fact, the gap actually do decrease as you increase the in-plane magnetic field, showing that this is much more rich and much more complicated than simply just valley splitting. What is the real nature over here? Yes, yeah. I like that. Yeah. In this case, it has a minimum, but not always. Some samples, uh, some filling fractions, actually, they don't. Some, some sample with a different uh, normal cycle, they don't show the minimum, no changes. So um, in, in a sense, uh, that it also depends on the disorder contents in the sample. More importantly, it actually depends on the, what is your perpendicular field. So certainly, this is not as simple as just spin splitting versus virus splitting. But in this case, the, the elementary excitation can be quite complicated. Might be this SU4 spins scumians in some areas and so on, but I don't know. Um, but simply just showing that much rich physics that we haven't seen in just Gallimarsonite, where you have the SU2, SU2 type of the spins here. So the short message here is basically we have awfully complicated systems, or for the theorists, maybe more interesting systems. But I know that already this becomes too much esoteric, so uh, uh, maybe I should kind of stop to talk about the, uh, the detail of the discussions and move on to something else. But at least this shows a flavor that once you're getting the, the better samples, that there are much more rich physics and more interesting physics comes out. Now, bilayer case is also interesting. Uh, bilayer, the, I mean, it was discussed intensively this morning by uh, Volodya. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the really good thing about the bilayer, especially for the device application, if you're interested in it, is you can actually control the gap by applying the electric field. And has been shown by many groups, um, including the uh, Feng Wang's group at the Berkeley. Uh, they actually shows that how size of the gap do changes applying the electric field there. And uh, the optical, this optical measurement shows that gap can be opened up, up to, say, 200 milli electric volt which is a sizable gap, and more of all, it's a tunable. Now, the optical measurement is here is a kind of local measurement. So you see that uh, if there is a local gap opens up, the optical measurement can pick these things up. On the other hand, all these transport measurements so far, that are done on the bilayer sitting on the silicon oxide. The gap, they can measure. Either they cannot measure the gap because of this uh, variable range hopping, or if they did measure the gap, such as uh, the MIT group, size of gap is probably order of magnitude smaller than what you measure in the optical gap. And that's understandable because the transport measurement, you have to pick up through the, the entire samples in the kind of global sense. So if you have the disorders, basically disorder broadening, that your size of the gap you are measuring is much smaller than what it should be. Now, this type of the things, again, coming from this uh, the disorder substrate and the silicon oxide. So if you go to the better sample, if you get the better uh, the substrate, maybe we can get to the close, the, the intrinsic gap you can open up. Indeed, that's the case. So here I'm, show you, I'm, I'm showing you that a bilayer graphene sample sitting on the boron nitride and etched samples and so on. Sheer characteristic itself, you see that uh, this is a kind of uh, great. I think this particular sample is one of the highest mobility samples we ever seen uh, on the boron nitride. Uh, low temperature mobility of the 300,000 centimeter uh, uh, volt seconds. Um, um, and moreover, if you look at this sharpness of peak, I think this is kind of really needle sharp and showing the surely that uh, the quality of sample is great. So such a sample we have um, put down this uh, top gates um, to create this bottom and top gate dual gate device. What you are seeing is indeed we, are, uh, we open up the gap um, or resistance increase and more importantly, we can actually do the activation measurement in the sample. And this activation gap we are seeing up to, up to the levels before this uh, dielectric breakdown happens is about 100 millielectric volt of the gap. And if you improve this quality of the gate more, 
and we are, we are pretty sure that we can actually increase even more. But what you are seeing here is now the transport gap, activation gap measured in by transport is comparable size with what you are seeing in the optical gap, showing that, that we are getting to the, the limits that uh, the uh, that really band gap is dictating that what, what you are seeing in the transport. As you see here that, uh, uh, okay, uh, you see the 70 volt of the back gate is breakdown <laughs> because there are only two data points there. Boron nitride itself, the um, dielectric breakdown is uh, fairly high. I think that's, um, I forgot the numbers, but something like the two volt one per one nanometer, volt. One, one or two volt per nanometers. In this case, in fact, the device was a breakdown because we didn't use a local gate underneath the boron nitride. We used a silicon oxide as a back gate. And uh, somehow when we anneal the hydrogen argon, uh, the, uh, the quality of the silicon oxide becomes worse. So gate breakdown basically through the silicon oxide. And that's why actually this device failed. But boron nitride itself, uh, the quality of the uh, dielectric breakdown is extremely good. I think this is kind of important, uh, the, uh, the case, because I don't have the, the further data here, but this actually allows us now, we can actually deplete the carriers in the bilayer case. So if you want to copy down some of the mesoscopic physical, physics studies, such as make the quantum dots was mentioned there, make the quantum point contacts and those kind of things, we couldn't do that before for the single layer because we cannot deplete the carrier because of this uh, client tunnelings. Uh, in bilayer now, because we can create a sizable gap, something like 100 milli electric volt ranges, if you go down to the low enough temperature, that's actually a pretty big gap so that we can think about just bringing up this all the quantum point contact, the quantum dots out of the, all this electrostatic kind of control. So I think that's uh, another uh, interesting direction so we can, we can, we can launch on uh, starting from here. All right. Um, this is just the beginning. Andrea actually uh, already showed that uh, we can build up the kind of whatever structures there. Uh, many of them start now, uh, they realize in kind of many multiple stacks, including this many, many multiple of uh, three or four, uh, the multiple stack of the tunneling junction device, drag device. And you see that kind of drag, I was kind of already mentioned before, so I don't have to go through the details. So this complicated device structures indeed possible, although this is painful because Man, the each steps you lose some of this uh, device. Uh, you have the finite device here. So if you go through the many uh, multiple stacks, basically total device yield becomes quickly small. But nevertheless, uh, the the method is there, and we can actually build up the device. We can actually uh, go through some of the interesting uh, the physics there. I think that's kind of one of the um, the message I can uh, leave at this point. Um, one thing about the, this drag uh, device, particularly, we see that more or less uh, this the T2 scale behavior, what uh, Andre mentioned. One thing we noticed that is, though, the absolute uh, the coefficients that what theory expect versus what we are seeing is uh, there is already uh, about the factor of four or five difference we don't understand. So that's one more point. Um, right. I want to actually change the gears to some of the slightly different topics, um, but related with uh, this boron nitride sample. But this is uh, the, according to uh, Andre Gaim, that some time ago, that it's an obscure corner of the physics, um, the thermoelectric power. I, I never said that. <laughs> I might imply. <laughs> right. Um, so thermoelectric power is, in fact, uh, Interesting, interesting physical phenomena that uh, they combine both the electrical transport and the thermal gradient. Um, basically, the measurement is, in a sense, straightforward. What you give, you, if you have the, this channel that you want to measure, uh, or the materials you want to measure thermal power, simply you just give it the temperature gradient and just measure the voltage across it. So that's actually fairly straightforward measurement. Now, it is interesting, however, such a it's a phenomenological quantity, in a sense, that can be used for the thermocouples, or parietic uh, devices, and so on, actually hits some of the fundamental the thermodynamic quantity. In fact, if you use Onsager relation, this thermal power is directly related with the parietic coefficients, which actually tells you that how much entropy transfer per charge actually happen in the system. So although this one can be quickly measured, that can uh, kind of uh, the access some of the important transport quantities such as entropy transfer per charge. 
Now, in typical system, typical semiconductor, typical metal system, in fact, there is a well-known the formula that relate thermal power, especially diffusion part of the thermal power, with um, the its electrical conductivity, which is known as a MOD formula. So basically, if the system is dominated by the diffusion thermal power, what it tells you is uh, if you somehow measure electrical conductivity at different chemical potentials, those the, the information of the, the conductivity can be related with the thermal power. And this has been one of the powerful relations that one can use. For example, tells you about the why sine of thermal power is related with the sine of the carriers you are dealing with. So if you have positive thermal power, your majority carrier that you are dealing with the, elect the holes. And if it is negative, you are dealing with the electron. Now this measurement, in fact, what can be done, any samples, including the graphene, here is this kind of device, uh, the layout, for example. So the, again, measurement is a kind of straightforward. What you need is you just contact the graphene. On the top of that, you just make the, the heaters nearby the one of the contact, so that by just sending the current through, you heat it up, temperature gradient sets up, then you just measure the how much actual voltage you induced. And if you just measure the, all these transport quantities, such as conductivities and so on, now you can actually see that where the motor formula works. <laughs> Simply by changing the, uh, the measuring the conductivity at the different gate voltage, which modulate the, fermi uh, the chemical potentials, you can even check it out this where the motor formula works. So in a sense, graphene is it kind of good, uh, the good system. You can even check whether this motor formula works. Now, the experiments measuring this thermal power already uh, was done a few years ago. And this is one of the moments I realized that how competitive the graphene research field. I thought I, I was the only, only one that doing this obscure corner of the physics without any competitions. <laughs> as soon as I just we posted these papers in the ConNet, soon after two papers followed the posting, you know, kind of just a matter of a few days. So three groups actually doing the same thing here. So that's, a, that's kind of interesting part of the, uh, the, the uh, history of the, the graphene research. Now, the, I don't want to go over all the details, but nutshell of the, this measurement is indeed whether the mode formula works. So I tell you that uh, indeed that works reasonably. I'm showing you here that the resistance versus gate voltage at the fixed temperature. So three different temperature. Well, not much changes because uh, this sample is sitting on the silicon oxide, so it's a disorder, and disorder is uh, the substrate disorder is most of the things uh, that govern this uh, transport here. We just do the measurement on the thermal power, basically completely different measurement, give the temperature gradient, and uh, just measure the, uh, the voltage across it with calibration of the temperature in the both side of the your contact. We can actually get the absolute value of the thermal power um, as a function of a gate voltage and diff uh, three different temperature in the corresponding with uh, this, the conductivity measurement. Now, I told you that there is a mode formula that connect between this conductivity or the resistivity to the thermal power. In fact, if you know that how much chemical potential change I induce, Fermi energy change I induce by gate voltage, I know that how actually I can treat this part by taking the derivative. And of course, change, uh, the, the relation between chemical potential to gate voltage is well known, as long as you know that what is the capacitance coupling. So there is no fitting parameter needed. I can just take this data, take the derivative, multiply these numbers, and compare with experimental data. Indeed, if you just do that without any fitting parameter, it's completely two different measurement, overlaps pretty well. I think not only position or peak, the absolute value of the, this or the agreement is pretty good. At the different temperature, you have the reasonable kind of overlaps with each other. So it tells us, indeed, Mote is a great man. Actually, it works great. Now, you can actually do even better. You can apply the magnetic field and just measure all these different conductivities, whole conductivity, longitudinal conductivity. There is a well-developed theory already uh, 20 years ago that in quantum regimes, then, then you can also match all this measured, the longitudinal component, transverse component of thermal power, and connect with all these transport uh, the quantities. And basically, in the graphene, it beautifully works. You see that this is a measured value, and this dark one is the calculated value from all this transport quantity, more or less reasonably match not only the positions, but also size. So this extended mode formula also works. So this tells us that, well, that everything should work as it should in single particle picture. 
Sounds good, but it's a little bit boring. But let me just go back to the, this slide and ask, is this real hold? Now, if you have picky eyes, OK, so this, uh, if you have picky eyes, then uh, this uh, works. But look at this. Uh, what is temperature? This one is uh, 200 Kelvin. I'm seeing there's some difference here, right? So in a sense, there's a deviation start kind of develops up. Now, why actually I show you 200 Kelvin only? Well, I can do also experiment at 300 Kelvin. There's a reason I didn't show you, because if you just kind of bring up the 300 Kelvin, deviation becomes uh, really noticeable. So although I cheated you by some mumbling, oh, there's a reasonable matching here, uh, but if you go to the higher temperature, it's clear that there is a deviation from Mott formula. So one thing that we know here is as you go to the higher temperature, we start to see the deviation from Mott formula. Well, in a sense, you can say that that is expected because Mott formula, if you just go back to the older Boltzmann transport calculations, basically assume that your electron gas is degenerate. And as you go to the high temperature, degeneracy can be a problem. Well, that's not the case. Because here, maybe degeneracy is a kind of big issue. But as you go to the higher gate voltage, say something like the 10 volt of the gate voltage already correspond to the, uh, the Fermi energy correspond 1,000 Kelvin in this case. So degeneracy is not an issue. Here, still, the electron gas is degenerated. But mode formula doesn't work out well. So what is really going on here? One thing we can realize is as you go to the higher temperature, we can easily pick up that basically inelastic scattering time between the electron becomes higher. Basically, inelastic scattering between the electrons becomes that that rate becomes higher. The kind of over the temperature, it actually uh, depends on the temperature square. So go to the higher temperature, we expect the more of the inelastic scattering, scattering between electrons. Now. I argue that this actually promotes many body interactions that in, in terms of this uh, thermal power. Especially if this inelastic scattering time is in this inelastic scattering rate between the electron is greater than the electron to impurity scattering, elastic scattering. Basically, you can quickly equilibrate electron gas all the times, and you can go, you can go to so-called hydrodynamic regimes. Now in the graphene, Turns out that's a regime. That's a regime that already calculated by the few theorists, including the uh, uh, Schwarzschild group and the Igor Linus group, showing that in the graphene this regime is quite interesting because it's not only hydrodynamic regimes, but also the dispersion relation you have is linear dispersion relation. Basically, this one really starts to mimic so-called relativistic hydrodynamic limits, kind of plasma physics type of uh, flavor, except that you can actually degenerate this plasma. One of the important conclusions out of this theory, which is very difficult, so I cannot kind of understand this one, but I can at least copy down the, what is the result there, is actually they expect that many of the thermodynamic quantity got changes, including the thermal power. For example, in this, the hydrodynamic limits, in degenerate case, your thermal power becomes universal, does not depend on any disorders and those kinds of things. And in fact, this thermal power is expected to be larger than what is expected from mode formula, single particle pictures. Now, in a sense, this is understandable in simple pictures, simply because if the electron-electron interaction becomes dominant, and say the, the hydrodynamic interaction becomes dominant one, basically most of the entropy of the electron gas is governed by the, their own scatterings, and they don't start kind of think, uh, they, uh, they don't care about what happened with the electron to the the other impurity scatterings. So it becomes universal, only depends on the Fermi energies. And it becomes large because you are dealing with the inherently many body states, many body interactions here. right? Is this really kind of working out? Well, to test these things out, we have to drive the system into the deep into the hydrodynamic limits, basically these limits, higher temperature. Now, if the sample has a strongly disordered, you have to go to thousands of Kelvin to see this one, which is basically on what reachable ranges before. Now having this sample, or the graphene sample sitting on the boron nitride, sup suppressing this, uh, the, uh, the disorder in the sample, now we should be able to reach some of these regimes in, in the sample on the boron nitride. Indeed, that's the case. 
So here, that sample sitting on the boron nitride make the this thermoelectric type of the device geometries. We particularly choose this device. We could have that we, we have even better device, but this device I like it because somehow this device, after all this device fabrication, you see that whole side is much better than electron side, as you see the resistance, resistivity is much smaller here, right? In a sense, using this device, I'm showing you that what is that where you, when you have the lower impurity than higher impurities in the same device, how this thermal power do changes. Indeed, if you just calculate the mobilities and all the scattering rates and so on, this side, beyond 50 Kelvin, you should drive the system into the hydrodynamic limits. So how does the data look like? I'm showing you here thermal power as a function of gate voltage. I, should, I, I told you that this side is our good side, higher mobility side and lower mobility side. What you're seeing here is thermal power is greatly enhanced in the whole side compared to the electron side. Same device, same calibration. There is no experimental artifact. Simply just changing the gate voltage. I'm seeing that much more enhanced the thermal power in that direction. The other way that I can argue that is if you just try to compute the mode formula out of the conductance you measure and compare, basically as you go to the higher temperatures, the whole side actually deviation grows while this electron side more or less matches the mode formula. That's another way to say that we are getting to the, the hydrodynamic limits. There is a better way I can argue this. If hydrodynamic limit is right, basically we expect more or less universal thermal power which actually depends on the linear in the temperature, which means if I just divide this thermal power I measure with the temperature, I expect it to collapse everything into the, this simple curves there, if things in the hydrodynamic limit. So I'm showing you the same data that I showed you before. I just divide by with temperatures and just compare with uh, the, the whole side and electron side. As you see here, the most of the whole side, especially going to the high temperature, most of the curve is collapsed into the universal curve while this uh, disorder dominated regime where mode formula works, basically that doesn't work. So this is another indication that indeed, as you go to the better samples, you are getting into the more interaction dominated regimes that appears in the relatively high temperatures here. So that's um, the, another use of the better quality of the samples and so on. So one of the topic that uh, Sophie saw uh, a few times was electron phonon scattering, electron phonon interaction in the graphene. Um, uh, this becomes important issues, especially if you want to make the device that work in the room temperature. Eventually, ultimate limit of this mobilities and scattering will be governed by the electron phonon scatterings. And it's important to understand how the electron phonon scattering actually happens. Now, the easy way that we can understand electron phonon scattering is simply look at the, how the resistance changes with the temperature. And here's a, a, some, some other old data done by uh, the uh, microfurous group that's showing that here is the resistivity of the electron side and whole side. Uh, I think it's a two different sample maybe. Um, just measuring the how resistance increases the temperature and this linear increase of temperature, you plug it into the, this formula, then you get the, what is the deformation potentials and so on. Now what you see here is though, I just block it out some of the high temperature data, only showing the temperature below 150 Kelvin. And the reason is if you just look at the whole paper, in fact, higher temperature, Resistance actually increases rapidly and becomes quickly super linear. Well, the reason why actually it's linear, increases super linear, there are some issues like the uh, interesting story, uh, different stories. Um, maybe surface polar phonon scatterings, we maybe quench ripples and all of these different scenarios. But nevertheless, one thing important, one thing interesting here is as you increase the uh, electric field, uh, as you increase the density, uh, this superlinearity actually starts to suppress. So at least uh, that's a good part. Whatever things it is, it probably comes from the, uh, the extrinsic, extrinsic region. We can actually suppress that by just increasing the, um, uh, the carrier density. In fact, we just uh, repeat this experiment sample on the boron nitride. Uh, we actually uh, the push up this temperature where the superlinearity actually started out. But nevertheless, even for the sample on the boron nitride, there is a, this superlinearity appears. So that's uh, pretty much common things. But again, as you go to the higher density, we can suppress those superlinearity a lot, and we can probably can use the, this type of the behavior. 
Now, so this actually tells us if you want to study the intrinsic electron phonon uh, interactions, it's better that we just go for the higher density so that probably large carrier density starts to screen out all this extrinsic effect and try to pick up the intrinsic electron phonon scattering. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, we actually use electrolyte um, techniques, which has been used for now by many other groups in many other different samples. Uh, basically, in this technique, we just put the salt into the mix with the polymer and supplying this voltage across those kind of ionic salt, uh, ionic, uh, the, the, the liquid, uh, uh, that basically you can put the charges extremely close to the channel that actually induce charges into graphene up to the 10 to the 14, or actually record we went down, went, uh, went up to the six times the 10 to the 14. So a lot of charges we can put there. Now, once we put a lot of charges, what we see here is indeed, as you go to the higher and higher densities um, by just applying the, electric, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the charges onto samples, the, the, this superlinearity starts to disappear, it becomes a straight. So that's a good part. We are seeing the more of <laughs> electron phonon uh, interactions. But on the other hand, we are seeing the low temperature, there are something start to happen. So instead of it's going really sharply in the linear, it becomes round off, and this rounding off becomes more and more increased. So we get rid of extrinsic high temperature part of the superlinearity, but we are getting some sort of low temperature part of superlinearity comes, uh, comes in. So what is really going on? In fact, if you just compare the temperature dependent part, those rounding off is more or less a follow t to the fourth behavior, and of course in high temperature it's a t in the linear in t. This behavior, the low temperature t to the fourth behavior, is in fact what we expect when you have two-dimensional electron gas, like the graphene, like the two-dimensional electron gas especially. This is what we call the block colonized temperature regime, simply just considering that both electron phon the electron phonon scatterings, considering both of the phase space of the phonon phase space and electron phase space. At high temperature, basically phonon is populated everywhere, so all the electron in the Fermi surface can be scattered. But as you go down to the lower and lower temperature, your phonon sphere becomes small because the phonon can be uh, uh, degenerate. Or that, uh, the only the temperature uh, the below the KBT type of the, uh, uh, the energy scale of the phonon can be populated. So only part of the Fermi surface can be uh, participate in the scattering events so that the scattering becomes quickly inefficient. That's why actually you just deviate from the linear T dependence and quickly the resistance uh, decreases the uh, dropping into the T to the fourth behavior. In fact, those crossover happens when this phonon spheres is coincide with uh, this electron spheres, and those temperature range is what you call the block renaissance temperatures, and uh, that can be controlled by just controlling this carrier density or the, uh, the Fermi uh, the uh, Fermi surface radius here. So seeing this one is what is expected. In fact, just considering this all the slopes and coefficient, matching with the theory, which was developed by a few people, including the Summers group, one can extract information such as what is the deformation potentials and what is phonon velocities that we can use to parameterize these phonon spectrums. Turns out those kind of the deformation potentials is around 20 volt electric volt which is well within this uh, theoretically repeat, uh, the, uh, the reported values. And sound velocity is also kind of within the reasonable regimes, and showing that electron phonon interaction is more or less what is aligned with uh, known from graphite. One more thing we can do here is following things. In fact, if you go back to some of the textbook, so I just copied down this uh, Zyman's textbook, and what original paper was published by the Meisner in 1935, what he did is he just plotted out how the resistance of metal changes over the temperature. Now, what you see here is he, well, first of all, that it's normalized uh, the resistivity, and the temperature is normalized by the Dubai temperatures, and beautifully, all different metals sit on the universal curve here. Well, in a sense, that is expected, because in this case, since Fermi sphere and the phonon sphere is about the similar size, what is the governing temperature is not the blue granite temperature, which is much larger in this case. So the Dubai temperature is a characteristic temperature. And if you go through the kind of conventional, the argument, typical argument, how the electron phonon scattering appears, you can quickly find out the older metals basically 
the resistivity versus temperature curve, if it is simple enough metal, can be collapsed into the, this universal curve, which is actually using so-called brilliant functions, and beautifully shows up that all different metal sits in. Now, of course, in graphene, this is a different story. In graphene, it's two dimensions, and dispersion relation is linear, and there's a pseudo spins, and so on. And moreover, the characteristic temperature we are dealing here is not the divide temperature, because in the graphene, the body temperature is much larger, and yet block granulation temperature is relatively small because we are dealing with a relatively small Fermi surface. Nevertheless, very similar universal curve stories works. Of course, formula is a little bit different because it's two dimension, because of it has a linear dispersion relation, but you can come up with this universal curve with normalized temperature with a block granulation temperature. Now, interesting thing here is a block granulation temperature I can control by the gate voltage. So I just plot it out with a sample with a different gate voltage showing that correspond to different block granulation temperatures. Like the, in, in this case, it's like the different metal, but nevertheless, it more or less follows this universal curve. Why this is important? Such a good match of the universal curve for the electrons, the holes, and all these different uh, the densities tells us that such a simple theory that we use actually describes electron and phonon scattering quite accurately showing this linear uh, dispersion relation. But in a sense, a bit boring, but nevertheless, we are no, the, 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 the simple calculation that provide electron phonon scattering, at least experimentally, we don't see any anomalies here. Um, so the message I want to deliver is, as you the, have the better quality of sample, basically we are seeing the, uh, the interesting physics there, and also, some of the new techniques, such as the electrolytes and those kind of things, we can actually start to push the sample on different extremes, different carrier density, more extreme carrier density, and so on. So I believe, I agree with Andre, uh, we haven't exhausted all this gold mine out of graphene, and maybe we have the, more of the, these interesting stories will come as we combine a better quality sample with uh, the, the new tools available. Thank you very much. Again, we expect the universal um, thermal power, but the form is different from the single layer form that I, get, uh, I just show you. Are you doing for suspended devices or on, on boron This is a device on the boron nitride. We could, in principle, do the suspend device. In fact, uh, the regime that I didn't discuss, but it's more interesting part, is non-degenerate regime. So where that you have now start to have the both electron hole thermally populated. So that's, you can think about really kind of interesting the hydrodynamic limits. Our sample uh, on sitting on the boron nitride is still probably electron hole puddles there, so we may not be able to hit uh, those regimes, uh, but suspend sample might be. So it could be interesting, interesting thing can be done here. Uh, another question, what did you hide uh, in those few transferences? Those few. Uh, excuse what? this question. <laughs> <laughs> what did you hide in the transparencies you didn't show? I can show you later. <laughs> There's many intercalate systems there. Uh, I think the highest uh, intercalate, uh, graphite intercalate superconductor actually appears in Kajim, uh, which actually TC is 11 Kelvin. And uh, we actually even use the uh, particular salt contains the Kajim and put into the single layer and bilayers and put uh, up to the charge of 5 times 10 to the 14. Down to 50 millikelvin, we haven't seen any superconductivity. So, well, is there any reason to believe that graphene could could be made to have? I think um, that's an interesting point. Um, so, <coughs> the thermal power itself is actually not too bad, um, especially if you just believe that uh, all this uh, hydro hydrodynamic enhanced thermal power. I think I'm getting something like 150 microvolt per Kelvin at kind of closed room temperature, which is uh, respectable numbers. And even better, graphene in the, that decade range, the conductivity is pretty good too. So so-called power factors that the, the numerator of the ZT is pretty good. Now what kills graphene in thermoelectric application is it has also damn good thermal conductivity. So somehow, if you kill thermal conductivity, such as if you just imagine somehow somebody make this um, isotope mixtures of the C12 and C13s and mixed, so to kill the thermal, thermal, thermal conductivity, maybe there is a chance. But I think that's highly speculative at this point. You would uh, have to keep the electrical conductivity up.
Yeah. Oh, electric conductivity is pretty good, though. I too. know, yeah. no, but <laughs> while you, you kill the thermal conductivity. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's why, that's, actually, C12 that's, and C13 that's, is interesting, because yeah. they do not touch the electronic part, presumably.